so it's uh, my pleasure to uh, present today's speaker, John Sterling from Carnegie Mellon University. This, he's going to speak not only, we are getting two for one here. He's going to speak about two proof assistants. Um, and uh, the first one is called Red TT and the other one is called Cool TT. So I'm expecting something extremely cool. John? Uh, thank you, Andre, for that very kind introduction. Uh, I'm also very grateful for the opportunity to speak to this uh, amazing uh, seminar. Um, I'm also uh, deeply aware that uh, it would not be appropriate for me to give a purely technical talk about some, some beautiful mathematics or some exciting new tools without acknowledging the fact that tens of thousands of youth in my country are streaming onto the streets to combat and resist the inhuman brutality that the decrepit old state is ceaselessly enacting against the black nation. Not only referring to the, the brutal and the cruel murder of George Floyd, Eric Garner, Breonna Taylor, Antoine Rose Jr. and Romeo Talley and many others, not only of the, um, the mass incarceration, but I also refer to the to the slow and plotting and the methodical murder of black people in which the slum landlord is the executioner and the rats and the mice and the mold are the lethal injection. The mold that destroys the human respiratory system and puts an end to the dreams of little children and their mothers. Truly there's two different Pittsburghs and I suspect the same may be true of many of the cities in which you live. And I urge you to go out and learn something about the other half of your city and the people who live in there. I wanna affirm before I begin with the technical portion of this talk, what I feel is perhaps the most, the most basic principle of human existence, that it's, it's right to rebel against reactionaries, and in particular that it is right for black people to fight for their freedom by any means necessary. I echo the comments of Mao Zedong in 1963, which are equally relevant today. I'm firmly, firmly convinced that with the support of 90% of the people of the world, the American black people will be victorious in their just struggle. The evil system of colonialism and imperialism arose and throve with the enslavement of black people and the trade in black people. And it will surely come to its end with the complete emancipation of black people. With that, let me pass to the technical portion of this talk, uh, which is uh, joint work with the, with the team here. Um, and we also, uh, of course, want to acknowledge our generous uh, sponsors, uh, which you can see in the upper right hand corner of the slide. Uh, so there will not be many slides. I simply want to um, explain a little bit what cubicle type theory is all about so that you have some context for when I show the tools. So in type theory, we always want a way to speak of two things being the same. Um, and uh, there are many different like design concerns that can uh, affect uh, whether um, a particular way of seeing two things as the same is uh, going to be practical. Um, and one very interesting way to think of two things being the same, uh, which uh, comes from, uh, from mathematics, is the idea of drawing a figure of a certain shape in a type. So the simplest kind of figure that you can draw in a type is the point-shaped figure, which is just an element of the type. But we can also think of types as having more structure. So maybe between those points, there are some, some lines in there. And maybe each of those little lines between the points is, uh, you can think of that as evidence for the sameness of those two points. And so a proof that two points or two elements of a type are equal, you can think of that as a interval shaped figure in the type. And of course the notion of a figure in a type is always given by a map out of, the, uh, out of another object that sort of distills uh, all the general abstract uh, aspects of that shape. And what's really cool is that if you iterate this process, you can get other kinds of figures too, like the figure of a square 
And so that expresses that, well, we've got this A01 is sort of the same as A00, and A00 is the same as A10, and A10 is the same as A11. But not only that, this line between A00 and A10 is in some sense also the same as the line between A01 and A11, and there is a surface between them. Um, so it's important to make sure that this notion of sameness uh, can actually be used. In, uh, so for instance, we would expect that it be uh, symmetric in the sense that if one thing is the same as another thing, then that thing should be the same as the first thing and should be transitive. You, can, you should be able to link uh, things that are the same and to, uh, you should be able to connect them. And the way that this is achieved in uh, cubicle type theory, where you start out with these shapes, like the interval, is that we add some more shapes. So, so far, all the powers of, the, of this interval are um, basically just cubes that are fully filled in of uh, arbitrary finite dimension. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to add some shapes that allow us to express uh, this upstairs uh, open box thing, which is not just the power of the interval. And so this thing fits inside this fully filled in square. And if I have a, uh, a figure of this open box shape in a type, this big blue region is um, representing a type, then there is a, um, a structure that I will impose on all the types to ensure that I can also extend this, uh, this box-shaped figure in the type to, uh, to an actual filled square. And it needs to be compatible in the sense that if I take this filled one and I just forget about the inside and the top, uh, then I should have what I started with. Um, and so these operations are sometimes called Kahn operations in cubicle type theory. Uh, the, uh, the top line here is often called composition, and the interior here is often called filling. Um, although, uh, in the kind of cubicle type theory that we are um, uh, working on, uh, the difference between these two things is kind of blurred. Turns out that we like to take the filler as a primitive, and then we can then project out the top face when needed. Um, so this is, uh, this is enough to uh, define combinators that make this notion of sort of geometrical sameness really, uh, really work as a notion of equality. Um, so for instance, if we want to reverse a path P that is from A0 to A1, well, we can form an open box shaped figure in A where the left hand uh, wall is P and we have a base that's uh, reflexivity, which is sort of just, if you take a point and just stretch it out into a line, and the right-hand face is uh, reflexivity. And then what the composition operation does, that extension operation that I just showed, is it gives us something that should count as, uh, well, gives us something that is going the other direction from A1 to A0. Um, and so that uh, can be counted as a symmetry. And likewise, there's another instance of this uh, that works for um, uh, composing a path P from A0 to A1 with the path Q from A1 to A2 in order to get a path from A0 to A2. And of course, I'm only showing the data of the top part here, but the interior of these squares, the interior is also giving us coherences um, uh, uh, that will allow us to uh, so by using these, uh, the fillers here, we can also construct higher associativities of transitivity and so on. Um, so that's kind of the basic idea of cubicle type theory. And I think that further intuitions will be gained by hacking with the code. So uh, let me switch to introducing Red CT. Uh, you'll have to bear with me for a second because I need to change the window that I am sharing. Uh, let's see here. Um. May I ask a very stupid question? Um, in your original um, diagram with the two, with the open box, right? Couldn't one also, if if one of the walls are missing, like uh, first reconstruct this other wall by pushing, say, the left wall to to the right along the line on the bottom, and then I can do the filling. I mean, is this also 
so generally speaking, um, we do indeed uh, allow uh, more complex ways of a box being open. So like in the classical models, you typically say like, okay, well, it's a shape where there's exactly one face missing. Um, uh, and in cubical type theory, it, for essentially type theoretic reasons, the closure under substitution, that notion is not going to be enough. So we generally do need to allow multiple uh, parts of it to be missing, and then we need to be able to add those in. Um, the conditions uh, for uh, when one of these shapes gives rise to a figure that can be filled in uh, differ between the different versions of, of cubical type theory. But the, um, the main idea is that you basically have to have a, you have to have a base and uh, then uh, you can connect to that what is called a tube along, um, uh, along a, uh, a sub shape of, of the interval called a cofibration. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, um, and please feel free to interrupt uh, with uh, questions. I want to just increase the font size of this window so that people can see. All right, uh, is that visible or? Uh, yeah, okay, good. Okay, so um, let's see how yeah. some of this stuff. Can you make it a bit larger? Certainly. Thanks. Problem. So, uh, the font is visible, but the top row is kind of in conflict with gizmos of the. Uh, oh, of the the itself. Yeah. I will make sure to use uh, next few lines only then. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, how does this shake out in Red TT? Well, Red TT is an interactive proof assistant whose design is very similar to uh, to Agda. Uh, so it should be familiar um, in that sense. We interact with it using a, a Vim mode, uh, but uh, perhaps some Emacs hackers in the audience will uh, uh, give us uh, an Emacs mode. So if I can just in interrupt just very briefly. You can move the gizmo. You can take the gizmo and just move it somewhere else. Thanks. Sorry. Oh, okay. Cool. All right. So um, let's let's see here. So what I would like to uh, to first define is the notion of a path in a type. Okay, so I've got a type A, and I have two elements of A, and now I would like to define the type of paths between those elements. And I'm gonna do it just like we did in the informal pictures. So uh, I'm gonna place a hole here, uh, which you can do with a question mark, and then I'm gonna run it. And so then what that does is it, uh, it puts uh, this display on the right. Now I need to move my own gizmos. Um, okay. It puts this display on the right, which shows what the system is asking for in that location. You will see that the notations on the right-hand side are slightly different from what's on the left-hand side. This is because the output is showing the internal language of Red TT. Where, uh, which is sort of a type theoretic core language, whereas the left-hand side is the surface language that users type in. Um, so we have two elements of a type A and we need to get a type. This U stands for universe and con means it's a type that supports those filling operations. Uh, so um, we have a special uh, type former in Red TT that's called an extension type. These are due to um, uh, Real and Schulman. And it allows us to construct maps out of the intervals, that's interval-shaped figures in A, uh, subject to some constraints. So one of the so what we will do, for instance, is we'll have a constraint that requires uh, the uh, if you apply this function out of the interval to zero, then the result should be a zero, and if you apply it to one, the result should be a one. And let's see if that works. Okay, good. Um, and so this basically shows how a path or a proof of equality between two elements of A is given by a line in A whose left endpoint is A0 and whose right endpoint is A1. And uh, we will see that this is a pretty convenient notion of equality because it allows us to very directly prove many extensionality principles that are very difficult to prove in ordinary type theory. Um, so the first example, maybe not the most exciting one, but the one that I can explain without uh, giving any uh, further information, is an extensionality principle for pairs. 
So for instance, if I have two types, A and B, and then I have P and Q that are elements of the product, uh, and let's say that I have alpha, which is a path uh, between the first projections of those pairs. Uh, and then I have beta, which is a path between the second projections of those pairs. Then I would like to get a path uh, from uh, a path from P to Q, the whole pairs. Let's see if that, okay, good. So now you can see that um, uh, the output here is telling us what we have and what we need. This weird expression is the internal notation for uh, these constrained interval shaped figures. Uh, so it's saying that I need an element of uh, A times B under a, um, a dimension I, uh, whose left side is P, P and whose right side is Q. Um, and so by attempting to interactively develop this, uh, this proof, we will see some important aspects of uh, Red TT. So how do we introduce a, one of these constrained maps out of the interval? Well, since it's a map, it should be by lambda abstraction. I have to bear with my bad typing. All right, so we're gonna abstract over the I. All right, and so now we can see that now we have a dimension in the context. That's good, element of the interval. Now we need to produce a pair. And the cool thing is that that constraint, the i equals zero, blah, 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 just got shifted into the judgment, into the goal here. Um, so this is a very important uh, aspect of a cubicle version of interactive proof development. So the idea of a hole in a proof, um, I would say like the first like truly rational uh, development of that idea is coming from uh, epigram. Uh, and was adopted in, uh, in Agda. Um, for cubicle type theory, you need something more because the notion of a whole needs to account not only for the type of the thing you need to put in there, but also maybe for a partial element that is some, uh, some constraints like this i equals zero p i equals one q thing that it needs to match. Uh, if we were not keeping track of this stuff in the whole, then what would happen is that it would just ask us for a element of this pair type, but then it would say we have a type error because a generic element of the pair does not have this boundary. Um, so uh, in Red TT, we have developed a way to push these constraints through the introduction rules of type theory. Um, a similar idea, I believe, um, has been independently developed by Connor McBride in some of his unpublished work on uh, implementation of cubicle type theory. Um, and recently, I guess maybe in the past year, um, some similar ideas have been adopted in cubicle agda, although my understanding is that in cubicle agda, rather than keeping track of this information locally, it is reconstructed from the uh, proof state. I hope that's not an incorrect uh, characterization. So what do we, where do we go from here? We need to make a element of this pair type. So you do that by making a pair. And we can see that now we have two holes and each one has its own boundary constraint. And what happened was that the boundary constraint that we started with that was involving P and Q has been decomposed into one involving first P, first Q and one involving second P, second Q. Uh, so that seems quite convenient. Uh, and to fill this in, we will use what we have in the context. The closest thing to a solution that we have is this alpha here because that's the one involving A. If we apply alpha to a dimension such as I, we're gonna get an element of A and it's gonna satisfy this boundary, which is exactly what we wanted. So let's do that. Alpha I. Okay, great. So that discharged that hole and we have to do the same thing for the second one. Good. And now we're done. Um, so now let's go back and revisit paths. So one of the things that's really hard about equality in, uh, in type theory is that sometimes you have an equation that doesn't even make sense unless you already know a different equation. And uh, those situations are usually the place where like if I'm trying to formalize something in, in Coq, I basically give up uh, because uh, if, I'm, if I have a structure, like a type together with a uh, family uh, of types on there, and I want to show that two of those are equal, I'm going to get really frustrated because the statement of the second equality involves a coercion along the first equality. So cubicle type theory gives a different way to deal with this problem, which is really nice. 
um, we have a notion of a dependent path uh, where we can actually consider a path not in a type, but in a line uh, of types that is an interval shape figure in the collection of types. And then we ask for the first element to be in the first side of that line, and then the second element to be in the second side of that line. And uh, then we can define uh, ordinary path Okay, then we can define uh, ordinary paths as sort of the degenerate special case of that, and that continues to work. And so the reason this is really nice is that if I generalize this thing to a dependent uh, sum, so now I have a family of types, and then I have uh, x colon a b of x, okay, and then the b, uh, here is going to be in this is going to be in b of alpha i i'll explain this don't worry so let's just see if that works oh i did something wrong didn't i this is why demos are so scary <laughs> let's see what did i do wrong pass d what's that oh pa pass d and not pass Thank you. Uh, it's good to have people to help. Um, yes. So uh, now what's going on here? Well, p dot second and q dot second have different types because p dot second is an element of b at uh, p dot first and q dot second is an element of b at q dot first, not p dot first. But those things are connected by this path alpha. So we can actually just do this line of types where it's, we take the family B and then we look at the fiber of B, not over, uh, not over uh, like any specific point, but over the line between uh, those two points in A. And the same proof works. Um, this, uh, so the principle of, uh, of this, um, this, these extensionality principles is roughly that because the path type is really just a special function type. You can commute it past almost any connected. Um, so the most sort of exciting and famous example is that function extensionality has a almost trivial rendering in cubical type theory. So if I have two functions uh, uh, and I have a proof that they take the um, elements to the same uh, uh, values, all right, then I should just be able to get a proof that the two functions are the same. All right, so how can I do this? It's asking for one of these weird maps out of the interval, so I'm going to abstract that. Okay, so now it's asking for a function, but it's a function that is sort of constrained so that its left side is equal to f and its right side is equal to g oriented on i. So let me abstract this variable x uh, here, and so now we can see that the um, the uh, Boundary condition here is continuing to be refined. Now we need an element of B, which is fx and gx on the appropriate uh, sides. And this, we're going to get it from alpha. So if we apply alpha to x, and then we apply it to i, we're going to get the right thing. So that is just a brief uh, demonstration of uh, sort of tubical uh, features here. And I would like to um, move on to showing um, some uh, more um, uh, some more interesting uh, aspects of RedTT. So a really important aspect of uh, cubicle type theory uh, is the idea of a higher inductive type. Um, a higher inductive type is just like an ordinary inductive type, except that you have two extra features. One feature is that constructors can take elements of the interval as an argument. Now, if it takes an element of the interval as an argument, then it's creating a, uh, a line in the resulting inductive type. And then furthermore, it is possible to constrain what that constructor should be equal to. Maybe it should be equal to other constructors at certain uh, uh, subshapes of the line that it's defining. So if I just sort of, if I expand this notation, if I haven't explained what that weird operator does, uh, 
we can define uh, something that's called the circle. Uh, uh, I guess it doesn't matter, but uh, by having a base point and a loop, which is going to be a line in the circle whose left and right side are both the base point. And in higher dimensional type theory, this is not the same as the unit type because this line is actual data. Um, so we can uh, do that. And um, uh, the uh, thing that is uh, of interest here um, is that um, you can take this, uh, this loop. And if you use those operations like I was describing before that allow you to, uh, uh, to compose or reverse um, lines in a type, uh, we can actually uh, make a lot of data. Um, if we start at the base point and then we take the loop and we take the loop again, we take the loop again, you can see how we might get uh, loops in the circle that correspond to an arbitrary uh, natural number, um, natural number times uh, going around. But we can also do the symmetry where we can take the loop backwards. If we take the loop backwards, we can uh, also get negative numbers of rotations. Um, and this uh, actually ends up um, uh, showing that the space of loops in the circle is uh, equivalent to the integers. Um, so this is maybe a nice um, demonstration of, uh, of what you can do in cubicle type theory. And it's a good demonstration also of some weird new kinds of computations that are available in cubicle type theory. So, if I open up this file uh, that is um, uh, proving the thing I just described, we can have a look at what is going on. Um, first, we can define uh, by uh, using um, an elimination uh, principle. We can define for any integer the, uh, uh, a loop in the circle. Okay, so the loop space omega 1 s 1 is the uh, set of paths between the base point and itself. We can define a loop in the circle that is basically going around n times in the appropriate direction. Um, and I don't want to get into the details of this uh, too, uh, because it's too technical for this talk. But this operation here is the thing that I was showing geometrically that is uh, finding the top face of an open box. And that's how we form the composition of the loop with itself. And we can uh, furthermore um, even write a function that takes a loop in the circle and calculates how many times it went around by using a really cool dependent type called the universal cover. I don't want to get into the details of how to actually do this because it's too technical, but I would like to show some cool examples. So, if we have, let me first define, well, let me just do a, a number that's low enough that I can count it properly. So uh, let me, okay, good. So if I can define the number three, um, let me then, uh, uh, let me, Now I can define a loop in the circle uh, that is going around three times. OK, great. And so now, uh, maybe it would be worthwhile just to print out what that looks like. This is a feature that we have. So it turns into this sort of weird uh, composition stuff that uh, you can learn more about uh, after my talk, if you want, by reading some of the literature. Um, and uh, now the really interesting thing is that let's see what happens if I compute what's called the winding number of this loop. I can actually uh, okay, I can do that. And let's normalize this to see what it gives us. And we can see right here that it gives us the number three. So this is a really cool example of what cubicle type theory is in advance over previous versions of homotopy type theory because we can actually compute these things directly. Uh, so that's really fun. Um, uh, now for uh, something a little uh, simpler, um, I would like to show an example. Excuse of me. Yes. Uh, I wanted to ask, 
you talk about the the universal cover mm -hmm. and like in traditional uh, mathematics that would be the real line i was curious how you would define such a thing in here like can yeah. you give a, a Certainly. brief explanation yes uh so this is actually a yeah very interesting um aspect of homotopy type theory uh, like how do you transform these sort of classical notions into type theoretic notions um so the universal cover of the circle is a family of types indexed in the circle and geometrically you should think of that rather as a space that is oriented in a certain way over the circle and uh because of um certain uh amazing uh, descent properties that are available in, uh, in homotopy type theory and cubical type theory, we can define that space by, um, uh, by considering its fibers over uh, all the different regions of the circle. So we will define the, the part of the space, this universal cover that is lying over the base point to be the discrete space of the integers. Um, and then we also have to explain the part of it that is lying over the loop. And then that needs to be a loop, uh, a loop uh, of spaces between the integers and itself. And uh, so one of the really great aspects of uh, cubical type theory um, is, and homotopy type theory in general, is that we have a lot of interesting loops between different types, uh, including any equivalence. So for instance, there's a successor map on the integers, and this is, an, uh, this is an equivalence. If you can take the successor, and then you can also go backwards. And so this equivalence is a symmetry between the integers and itself. And so we can actually form a path using the univalence principle here. Um, and so then the universal cover is then defined to be over the base point, it's the integers, and then over the loop, it is the equivalence, the successor equivalence. And then all of the derived loops in the, uh, in the circle, the thing that is over those in the universal cover is going to be the composition of that successor equivalence with itself in the appropriate direction. Um, so this, this uh, approach of sort of defining a dependent type, type theoretically, this is finding some amazing motive of induction, uh, but geometrically, this is defining some very cool space that is oriented in a very cool way over the circle. Okay, this is amazing, thanks. Sure, thanks. Yeah, I, I, I am always having my mind blown by it, um, uh, this kind of stuff. I, I have to say that I first encountered you know, any geometrical ideas in the context of type theory, and I've been sort of trying to claw my way to learn uh, where they came from. Uh, so it's been, every time I learn a bit more, uh, it uh, is a little bit more uh, remarkable to me. Um, okay, uh, so, now, if we, uh, oh, geez, I need to pretend to save that. So uh, now I would like to give um, uh, an example of interactively uh, programming with higher inductive types, because this is uh, kind of a very fun uh, aspect of, uh, of uh, both Red TT and, and other proof of systems like Cubicle Agda, um, that, uh, where the cubicle type theory really shines. So we can define another kind of space, uh, a higher inductive space, uh, that represents the homotopy type of the torus. Um, so the torus is just a, the donut shape, and we can, uh, we can define this in the following way. So imagine having uh, a point, and then you have a loop between that point and itself. Okay, if you forget the fact that uh, those, um, the two points are the same, then maybe you can just think of it as a line. And then maybe you have a line going in a perpendicular direction, so now you have a sheet. And then what we want to do is we want to take that sheet and we want to glue the horizontal edges together. And then we also want to glue the vertical edges together. And if you do this with a piece of paper, you will see that this makes a, uh, well, a kind of crappy version of a donut shape. And in cubical type theory, this is rendered in the identical way. So uh, remember from before that this boundary of I operator is just shorthand for uh, constraining both endpoints. I'm not going to unfold that anymore because now I have to find it. So this path here is, uh, uh, is giving maybe the horizontal edge, and this is giving the vertical edge. And then this square is giving a surface that is, that is between them and causing everything to get glued together in the right way. And to construct a map out of this type, 
we basically have to draw a picture of a torus in the type that we're mapping out into. That's what maps out are. We're drawing torus-shaped figures. And uh, one result um, in homotopy type theory uh, that is, um, uh, uh, well, it's a very basic result in topology, um, but it was originally really, really hard to prove in homotopy type theory. There was a heroic uh, proof uh, by Kristina Soyakova of this fact, is that the torus shape is the same as the product of the circle with itself. Um, in cubicle type theory, this really difficult proof becomes really easy. It just becomes a simple functional program in type theory. And so we will have a look at how this works. So we want to make a map from the torus into the circle times itself. And uh, let me just put this little quit declaration here. All that does is it tells RedTT to forget the rest of this file so I can uh, just uh, not have any spoilers. And uh, let me actually comment all this out. Oops. All right. So the elim tactic, just uh, all it does is it is what lets us make a map out of a higher inductive type. And if I don't give it any branches, it's just going to create holes for me that tell me what I need to put in. So I need to, get, I need to draw a point in S1 times S1. I need to draw a line between that, between that point and itself in S1 and S1. I need to do another of those. And then I need to draw a cool surface uh, between those lines in the appropriate way where everything matches up, all the corners are good. Um, so we can start defining this. So let me just put that in there. I'm gonna just uh, draw the point in S1 times S1, that's just the base point and itself. And now uh, what I can do, I can then uh, put a hole for the branch for the first line, for the first loop. And it's, you can see that it is constrained. So now it knows that I put base base in the first part. And so now the goal here is saying I need to have a loop between base base and itself. So uh, today is not the day for me to explain why these are the right things to type in. Uh, today I'm explaining what happens when you type things in, that's all. So I can put that in. And now I have some remaining holes that I need to fill in that are kind of of a similar character. You can see all oh, there's all this scary stuff here that is referring to the holes uh, that have been uh, sort of unleashed by, uh, by the uh, elaborator. Uh, so if I put this in there, now we can see that I need a, uh, a square that has this more complex boundary and it's varying in two dimensions. And well, it seems pretty clear that in either case, we're gonna need to put some loops in various places. And it turns out that the right loops to put in are these. Again, if you want to know why these are the right ones, I invite you to play around uh, with the implementation. Uh, okay. And we also can make the inverse map. The circle times itself to the torus. And this exposes some other interesting aspects of Red TT. So rather than commenting this out, let me just put a hole right here and a semicolon, which allows me to inspect the proof state at this location. So I need a map out of S1 times S1 into the torus. Now, I don't have a good way to make maps out of S1 times S1. I only have a good way to make maps out of S1. So what I can do, we have some special tactics in Red TT that get elaborated to more complex forms involving generalizing various variables and so on. And one of them is this little split thing, which will transform my goal from map out of a product to the uh, uncurried or curried, I never remember which is which, is which uh, one. So then if I put that there, um, I now, so you can ignore all this stuff, that's just artifacts of the generalization and just look at this. Now I need a map out of the circle into maps out of the circle. And that looks like something good. So I can now apply the eliminator because the first part is S1. So if I apply the eliminator, then in my branches, I need to make maps out of the circle into the torus. And I can do that again using the eliminator. Uh, so that's uh, how that works. And the final uh, kind of cool uh, aspect of uh, Red TT's surface language uh, that I would like to show is that we also have some uh, nice facilities uh, for making it easier to work with eliminators in some simple cases. So let's uh, have a look at how we would do this. So we, now we need to make the coherence between uh, the round trip of going back and forth and not doing anything. So that's what this is doing. And so if we look at the goal, it's something pretty brutal. It's, uh, it's um, 
uh, a map out of the torus into some sort of super complex stuff involving the eliminator of the circle. And I wouldn't blame you if you find this impossible to read. I, I do as well. But if we want to prove something about these maps, we should just think about how we created them. The T to C map, we created it by elimination. So we should do elimination. So now we have a bunch of goals for the different cases of the torus. And each of these goals looks much simpler. And in fact, they're all going to follow by reflexivity, um, which is, again, forming a degenerate path. And what RedTT supplies is the ability to make a wildcard pattern, uh, which the meaning of this is that if you put a tactic right here, it's going to do a split, and then it will run it in every branch. And we're done. Now there's an even more convenient notation here uh, using the lambda, and that will do that. Um, this is also compositional. Um, in the sense that we can uh, define a more complicated one. So if we want to make the round trip for the other direction, we need to prove something about a map that's going from S1 times S1. And we can actually define uh, this by means of doing a very special pattern lambda where we, uh, the meaning of this thing is, okay, first split it, and then apply the eliminator on the outer one. And then in all the inner branches of that elimination, perform the eliminator again. And that does it. Now, just to show what this actually does, let me print what this turns into. Because RedTT is actually doing a pretty immense amount of work for us. This turns into this absolutely brutal uh, uh, a nested elimination. Uh, so this is uh, perhaps kind of neat, uh, pretty convenient. It would be very painful to do that by hand. So maybe this is a good time to remark that RedTT does not support dependent pattern matching or really any kind of pattern matching. We program with eliminators. Um, this is in contrast to uh, things like Kubical Agda, which have a super convenient and amazing um, uh, pattern matching notation available. Um, Long term, I think that's a really nice idea. Um, in the short term, we have uh, done the eliminators because they're simpler. And then in order to make those practical, we've needed to come up with some nice tactics like that. OK. Um, and then, uh, well, these things prove that we have an isomorphism between the torus and the circle times itself. And then the univalence principle shows that uh, we can actually draw a line in the collection of types between the circle times itself and the torus. Um, OK, so now would be a really good time for me to switch gears uh, and talk about something that I promised, uh, which is a new uh, prototype proof assistant that our team uh, is developing uh, called CoolTT, or codenamed uh, CoolTT. I don't know if it's actually called that. Um, uh, let's see here. How do I get out of this? So let me, oopsie daisies, uh, was cool PT demo. So, oh, all right, so uh, what is the question again? Yes. So the, the first tactics, this comma and brackets, wouldn't this just be uh, applying the uncurry function and then doing the, the elims? Uh, system. Yes. Mean, yes. I mean, so it seems like you just want to uncurry this. Uh, uh, you want to the curried version of the. So, so I mean, in Acta, yeah. you would write something like um, uncurry and then um, lm and so on, right? Indeed. So that's actually exactly what these things elaborate to. Now, the difference um, is that uh, in Agda, you have a pretty powerful unifier that can uh, fill in motives of induction um, in, in the appropriate places. Um, we do not have the benefit of a very powerful unifier. I haven't really put the dollar amount of how much a good unifier for cubicle type theory uh, costs, but it costs more than I have. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, if I were to write out um, like those functions and use them, I could, but then I would need to write in a lot more annotations. So these kinds of uh, combinators that we supply in the language allow us to, um, uh, to easily define things without uh, needing to generalize the uh, induction hypothesis by ourselves. 
Um, so that's uh, useful for us, but maybe less useful if you had a, um, uh, a more powerful uh, unifier like you do in, in yeah. Aga. Yeah. Uh, yeah, one day uh, I would like to, um, uh, okay, to pursue yeah. that, but I, I would just like to note that um, unification in the context of, uh, of the interval is very complex, um, especially in the context of uh, Cartesian cubical type theory, where we have um, uh, not only uh, equations between, say, i and 0 or i and 1, we also have equations between i and j, and we have in essence, equality reflection for those equations. Uh, so this makes the unification problem very difficult, and it's unclear what the cubical version of the pattern fragment would be. Uh, so that's a very interesting area of future research. OK. Uh, so what is cool TT? Well, cool TT is a lot like red TT, um, except it's smaller because uh, we have fewer features uh, so far, because we're just building it now. But the main point of cool TT was to test a couple ideas. Um, uh, one thing that we wanted to do was to have uh, a much more powerful type system uh, that I would like to think of as a logical framework and then formulate the cubical type theory inside there. The logical framework is sort of the basic judgmental uh, aspects of the interval, the notion of a co-fibration, which are these sort of uh, uh, subshapes of cubes, um, and uh, the ability to split on, uh, on disjunctions, um, which is how you define a map out of a subshape of a cube. Um, in red TT, these, are, these notions are all kind of purely schematic and therefore kind of inconvenient. Whereas in, say, cubical agda, these notions are first class. So we wanted to also have first class notions of uh, interval and co-fibration. Um, and uh, we have contributed some interesting new ideas for uh, a, uh, a version of the splitting uh, of, along a disjunction uh, that works better uh, than uh, is currently available um, in cubical agda. So we very, we very much hope that uh, we can collaborate and uh, get these ideas uh, implemented in other tools. Um, so uh, let's uh, uh, give an example. Uh, an example of something that we can't even write down in Red DT is the type of a general composition operator, one of those gadgets that fills in those open boxes. But in cool TT, the logical framework is powerful enough that we can actually write this down. Let's warm up by writing a coercion operator, which just takes us from one side of a line of types to another. So I'm going to call it my coe, my coercion. And I'm going to do the following. So I have a line. Uh, of types. And I have a dimension. So this can be thought of as sort of a location on that line. If R was 0, it would be the left part of that line. And then I have an element of that part of the line. And then I want to define, I want to extend this. Uh, I want to extend this to um, a uh, I want to extend M to a line in A. So I had just a point, but now I want to extend it to a line. And furthermore, I want to make sure that if I look at this line, that the R part of this line is actually the same as what I put in in the beginning. So we have something called cubical subtypes, which are also available in cubical agda, uh, although um, uh, again, I, I would say that ours are a little bit easier to work with because we have uh, stronger equational rules and uh, a bit more sophisticated elaboration for them. Uh, so I'm going to form a subshape of A at the location where I equals R, and I'm going to require that it be equal at that location to M. So sub, and then type, and then co-fibration and then term means it's the subtype of this type such that when this is true, we get this. And let's see if I type this incorrectly. OK, I'm glad I did. I'm probably going to make some mistakes because I'm switching between languages that have slightly different syntax uh, for various reasons. All right, uh, so we can abstract the dimension i. All right, and now. We have this boundary here, so we need to make an element of AI that on the R part matches M. And 
one of the primitives of cubicle type theory is actually just a co operation. So I can actually just type this in and hopefully it will work. And it did work. Okay, that's great. Uh, so this is an example of something that we uh, uh, did not even really have the uh, uh, ability to write down. Um, although maybe this one we could have written in Red TT, but the next one we definitely couldn't. So COE is, is easy. Now let me consider a much more complicated version where we are filling one of these shapes. And uh, as Andreas pointed out um, uh, earlier in the discussion, um, the shapes that we can consider are not just open boxes, but they're generalized open boxes uh, where many things may be missing. So we're gonna have a starting dimension. And then we're gonna have what's called a co-fibration that uh, um, uh, determines basically the part of the box that is still there. And, uh, and then the rest of it is the part that we need to fill in. Okay, so the cofibration is called phi. And so F, which is, the, is a universe of cofibrations, which are basically just proof irrelevant propositions. And these are closed under equality of dimensions with equality reflection for dimensions. And they're also closed under disjunction. Uh, and there's a, um, an elimination form for the disjunction that has the full definitional eta law of disjunction. Uh, which is very hard to achieve, but is actually really important for the usability of cubicle type theory. Um, okay, uh, so I don't expect everyone to fully understand what I just said, so let me just start typing in some stuff. Okay. So now we need to make a partial line in A, so it's not going to be AI here. We need to actually, we're only defining the phi part, because that's the part that we're starting with. So we're going to just constrain along phi, all right. So the point here is that we are making a partial line that's partial in the, in the sense of being defined only on the phi part of the line. And then we are going to extend that to a total line, just like we did upstairs, except we want to do it in such a way that it is going to match the input on the part that was originally defined. So this is sort of a conservative extension of this uh, partial line to a total line. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, uh, quash anything that we had already written down. That's very important. So we're going to say that on, uh, well, we have two things that we've got to worry about. The first thing is that we, when, uh, when r equals i, we want it to match um, uh, this thing here. And when phi, um, uh, when how am I doing this? Right, and uh, oh, I put something wrong here. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so um, we are defining a partial line, not only defined on phi, but it's also defined when i equals r. So geometrically, this part is the base of those open boxes that I was showing before. And then phi is all the stuff that is extending like the, the sides. So that's a good intuition to have, even though the general case is much more complicated. And so what we need to do is make sure that uh, the output matches on the part that we already had. And so we can simply do that. And this is a pretty complicated type, so I probably made a mistake. I definitely made a mistake. So let's see if we can debug this. Uh, okay. All right, so here I need a subtype, okay? So, oh, I know what I did wrong. Ah, this exposes another cool thing. So now here I need to put M I, but there's another argument to M, which is this proof. Because we have sort of like generalized equality reflection for co-fibrations, we don't need to put a proof in here because this is being defined under the assumption that this is true. So I'm just gonna put an underscore, which stands for give me the proof if there is any. And all such proofs are equal because the co-fibrations are proof irrelevant. Uh, I still did something wrong. Well, if this doesn't work, I will uh, soon uh, give up on, on this example by undoing everything until I get to the beginning of this file where I have my worked version. Okay, so you didn't see that. This is definitely exactly what I just typed in. And so now, this is sort of like when I pull the fully baked food out of the oven 10 seconds after putting it in. Uh, now I can use the built-in composition operator to instantiate this. Uh, I, A, uh, 
Okay. And we're done. Uh, so this is, um, uh, this is basically all I wanted to show about CoolTT today. There is much more, um, but maybe the point that is worth making is that these things are first class, just like in cubicle agda. Um, we have uh, cubicle subtypes, uh, just like in, in cubicle agda, although we have uh, some stronger rules of definitional equivalence concerning the disjunctions and the uh, eliminations of disjunctions, which I unfortunately uh, didn't have a chance to show you today. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, maybe that would be a good time to uh, break for questions and discussion. Thank you. Um, I think there, there are many several ways to clap. Let's try this one today. Anybody who knows how to do this should do this. Um, questions? Well, I have a question. So uh, I, I didn't really see anything that I haven't seen in, in Cubicle Agda. So I'm just wondering if you could maybe say some things that from a practical standpoint could convince someone to give Kuti a try. Like, so, so, so why, what, what, is the, what is the new stuff? What, what is the value add here? Sure. Um, so there's... Uh, so one one difference is uh, that both Red TT and Cool TT are uh, experiments with uh, a different version of cubicle type theory. So we're experimenting with Cartesian cubicle type theory, uh, which differs from the De Morgan uh, version uh, that is implemented in cubicle agda in a few ways. Um, we have a much simpler version of the interval, uh, but in contrast, we have much more uh, complex uh, con operation. So a composition operation is more complex uh, and expressive, uh, uh, at least from the user's point of view, than the one in uh, cubicle agda. It's still very unclear, I think, to all experts in the field um, which style is more usable. Although I personally argue for the Cartesian approach because it is uh, uh, closer to a version of cubicle type theory that can be shown to be equivalent to uh, uh, that can be shown to have a model that's equivalent to uh, classical uh, spaces. Um, so that is one reason why we are preferring the Cartesian approach at this time. Um, in regard to concrete differences between cubical agda and um, red TT and cool TT, so cubical agda has a much uh, stronger um, internalized notion of co-fibration and interval than red TT. And one of the design goals of cool TT was to sort of bring us up to par in that respect. Um, along the way, um, we have uh, uh, been working on uh, what I consider to be superior um, implementations of uh, the uh, holes in the context of, uh, of these uh, partial element constraints. Uh, so you'll notice that when you use uh, cubicle agda uh, in a cubicle way, um, uh, maybe 70% of the time that you spend uh, doing a proof a large part of your development is colored yellow in Emacs. And what that means is that there are undischarged unification constraints. Uh, the reason for this, in my understanding, is that these boundary conditions, uh, rather than being kept local to the goal, are actually discharged um, and sort of asynchronously uh, uh, discharged by Agda's elaborator. And they, they say, oh, I hope that this is true. And until you make it true, uh, it won't necessarily be true. Uh, some improvements have been made in that respect in cubicle agda where these things can be in many cases gathered up from the proof state and uh, made local to the goal. Uh, but one of our uh, design considerations is we believe that this should be treated in a first class way uh, directly in order to improve usability. Another uh, value add of cool TT over cubicle agda currently is uh, the following. Uh, let me uh, just write this in a comment so I don't get owned by the syntax. Um, so uh, if I am in a context where I have something that is of type phi or psi, or I don't know how to draw a psi, so let me just do a phi prime, uh, then I can define a, uh, a term uh, that says phi uh, m phi uh, prime m prime. And this term uh, needs to be equal to uh, m 
if phi holds, and also needs to be equal to m prime if phi prime holds. But moreover, it needs to be equal to, uh, to uh, so suppose that these were both the same, it needs to be equal to m, um, uh, and so on. Um, these equations are roughly the universal property of the disjunction. And uh, in cubical agda, many of these equations are present and some of them are not. Uh, there is a rather cryptic message in the documentation uh, that I actually added to cubical agda because I got very confused one day um, that explains uh, some of these equations that don't hold. Um, so uh, I would say that's one of the value adds. Um, I would very much like for, for the rest of these equations to be implemented in, in cubical agda because I think they're really good. Um, and I think that uh, our work shows that it is, uh, it's possible to, to do so, uh, even though, generally speaking, the universal property of a strict uh, disjunction is usually out of reach. By making some sensible restrictions on what cofibrations can depend on, it is actually possible uh, to do this in general. Other questions? Uh I have a question, uh, being a complete outsider of cubical type theory. Can we say that cubical type, that the real thing we have here is that we can have a dependent function type from a interval and they use the thing which we don't have in standard type theory is that we cannot constrain it. Or we can constrain it, but only using some equality, which is not very useful. And that now here you can have some other set of types from func from an interval into some other dependent type, depending on it, such that certain equalities hold. Is this somehow the the crucial thing of it? Yes, I, I strongly believe that that uh, combined with the idea of a um, an extensional or definitionally univalent universe of proof irrelevant propositions. If you combine those, what you just said and that, that to me is the essence of cubical type theory. And uh, so one of the uh, ideas of CoolTT's design um, is to take that very seriously and build a logical framework, basically an extension of Martin Lewis' logical framework with an interval, this universe of co-vibrations and a, uh, a sort of cubical subtype that allows those constraints to be expressed in a useful way. And then cubical type theory itself is defined as a universe in that logical framework. And because the, the universe um, uh, can be defined in whichever way you please, we are able to equip every code in that universe with the composition operations uh, that, that we discussed in the beginning. So yes, I very strongly agree that the essence lies in, in dependent products out of the interval that can be constrained in some kind of a, a useful way. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Can you use this to implement other forms of two-level type theory? Hmm. Um, framework. Uh, I have. Uh, I, I've thought about that question uh, a little bit. I don't know about um, two-level type theory uh, in particular. Um, although I guess the sense in which we have a top-level thing where where we don't expect things to be calm, instead we just sort of uh, they're sort of the raw cubicle business um, is very reminiscent. Um, but a related application of this logical framework that I've been interested in pursuing is the following. Suppose that we've, we've got this universe F of proof of relevant propositions, um, and we have really good ways to split on them and so on, and it would be cool to use it for something other than co-vibrations. And one of the things I was thinking about is that this, uh, this uh, type theory with F, uh, if I added a feature to allow you to declare sort of a fresh um, uh, co-vibration, uh, then I could define uh, any open modality in a, uh, in a way that has a very strong uh, definitional equivalence. Um, this would allow cool TT to be used, for instance, as the internal category of glued topoi, uh, where the open subtopos is given by exponentiation of an, uh, of an open uh, subterminal. Um, and so I think this would be a very interesting way to synthetically develop, uh, say, canonicity proofs and so on, 
uh, inside of uh, a dependent type theory. There is a lot in the question, so let me ask a question. Um, so the F is the co-fibrations, and it has a certain structure. What is it? That's like a lattice or something, right? Um, right. So if you want to vary F, then how much of quantity do you have to re-implement? Uh, so currently, what F includes is hard-coded. So it includes equality of, of the dimensions. It includes disjunction and, and, the, and the conjunction. Um, and uh, for instance, something that we would like to add is inequality uh, that is like uh, less than or equal to, because we are interested in uh, directed type theory as well. And to add this, we will have to change the core. Uh, luckily, it's pretty local to a specific module that we'd have to change, but uh, we do not provide the ability uh, to for the user to add new uh, core vibration connectives. Right, because it involves uh, implementing some decision procedures, doesn't it? Precisely, yeah. That that's the the main thing for us. Um, we need a, a we need a way to implement this sort of generalized equality reflection of uh, of the core vibration theory. Um, in a way that, at least in the simple cases, is efficient. Um, so uh, another cool idea would be to just sort of have all this stuff in, in user land. And I was actually thinking about maybe trying to prototype something like that in Andromeda at some point. Um, my only concern is that I think for it to be practical for um, like actual proofs, um, we may need to, to be able to hard code it in, uh, in OCaml. Uh, yeah, because it's it's it's. Uh, I mean, like, how do you know that two dimensions are equal? Well, you have to use like a union finds data structure to to do that. Uh, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. Somebody should ask the obligatory question, and Bas has raised his hand. So, Bas. <laughs> so, how how about guarded cubicle type theory? I know you've thought about this. Ah, uh, well, maybe it's time to think about that again. Um, uh, if, if I'm being very honest, I, I uh, got very discouraged with uh, the difficulties of uh, accounting for um, those kind of modalities in, um, in, in the context of a well-behaved type theory, a type theory with good syntactic properties. But it seems like uh, there has been a flurry of recent work this year that may just solve all my problems. So uh, I would be very interested in uh, considering such an extension. Thanks. Speaking of usability, I would like to request that maybe you implement some way uh, to kind of fold parts of uh, the output. Uh, if you remember, a few months ago, I was tried, I tried to prove the Diaconesco theorem. Ah, uh, yes. And I basically gave up because uh, at some point, like I had to use uh, like equalities between univalence induced terms and the output. Oh my God. Like <laughs> does, dozens of page long and I just gave up. I <laughs> couldn't make any sense of it. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Um, that's actually one of the things that um, uh, we really wanted to improve uh, from Red TT because uh, Red TT, it sort of just unfolds things naively and it unfolds things too far so you just get kind of owned. Um, like it's important that definitional equivalence be closed under unfolding, but we should have a way to display to the user something that isn't fully unfolded. And Jupiter yeah. Agda does a pretty good job of this. Um, so uh, cool TT uh, is implemented in such a way that uh, for the display of goals, things don't get unfolded unless they have to. Actually, there's currently a bug that I think I introduced this week that makes things never get unfolded. Uh, so if anyone is interested in uh, doing some hacking, uh, maybe it would be fun to fix that, although maybe I will have to fix it myself. Um, but yeah, we, we take that concern very seriously because if you're trying to do something other than toy examples, um, having all the fanciest notions of holes and interactive development in the world, it won't help you if you can't understand the goal, if the goal is 10,000 pages long. Yep, indeed. Thanks. We have an obligatory question, it seems. It came out, it just grew as a tradition, which is that we should ask every speaker whether there is a trusted core or whether you can delineate your code into trusted and untrusted and how large it is. <laughs> I hate that question. Um, let me tell you why. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, so first let me say, there is a trusted core, but it may not be what uh, some people uh, are, are hoping for. Um, let me say why I don't really believe in, in trusted cores. Um, and uh, let me clarify what I mean by that. I do believe that you should have a core language, uh, which doesn't have uh, all sorts of like crazy unification and uh, high level features uh, going on. I do believe in that very strongly. And so we implement that. What I don't believe necessarily is that you actually ever need to have a type checker for that core language. Uh, what is important about the core language is that definitional equivalence must be decidable. It is important that the surface language should have a decidable uh, or at least semi-decidable, but I prefer decidable elaboration into the core language. We, if you implement the proof assistant correctly, you do not need to retype things that are in the core language. Um, so uh, whether or not you, you have this sort of like trusted, uh, trusted separate language that someone else can independently write a type checker for, I think that's something that we often say in order to impress uh, people who are giving us money, but I'm not sure that it's an important uh, idea. So where, what actually is trusted and what do I think is important to have be isolated and trusted? Um, I consider it to be important to have the primitive uh, refinement rules, say the introduction rule for the pi type, the elimination rule, those things need to be trusted. They need to be trusted because uh, you, well, if you don't trust them, then you're kind of owned. And separately, they need to be trustworthy because they are, that's how you tell that you've actually implemented type theory. So in red TT and cool TT, we have a module that's called the refiner which uh, is a series of trusted uh, and isolated backward inference rules in the LCF style um, that, uh, that decompose, uh, decompose types. And then everything outside of the refiner is supposed to only call the refiner. Do we have an abstraction barrier between these two things to prevent someone from doing something bad? No, but in principle, you, you could put one in. Okay, thanks. So actually, um... My understanding of trusted core doesn't necessarily mean that you have a, a type checker that rechecks anything, because I think that's in the law. It's a, as I say, it's a nice story, but it's not really realistic. But nevertheless, uh, it sounds like you do have something that's uh, called uh, trusted core, which is what you described. So in, in an LCF style prover, it's going to be very clear what that's supposed to be. That's supposed to be your, the implementation of the abstract data type of judgments or, or whatnot. It's the stuff right. that really, really needs to be correct, but that does not necessarily mean that there's some independent rechecking thing going on. That's, that's, that's an option as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, that's a very good point. And maybe just to clarify, um, while in principle it would be possible for us to have an abstract type uh, for the primitive uh, refinement rules, uh, for practical reasons, we don't do so because, well, there actually are places where I, I do need to write down something that I know to be correct um, in, in the uh, outer part of the proof assistant and going through the rules would just not be practical. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in the Andromeda, the, the philosophy we take there is that um, if, if it seems like you, the, the trusted part is, is, is missing some uh, really useful part of the uh, interface, um, then what you need to do is you need to convince yourself that that interface is derivable or admissible or that what you're doing is not nonsense. And then you add it because nobody says that the trusted core needs to be composed of orthogonal in, independent primitive operations and nothing else because that's just, mm -hmm. that's just like saying that the only print operations will be that you print zero and one. You know, that's, yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah. Of course, then you pay the price, right? You make it bigger. Right, yeah. And again, I'm not too concerned about the size, um, but sometimes it's, it's good to be able to just write down a term that I have externally proved to be uh, correct and not actually have to run the refinement rules on it, which, which can be expensive. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. But I, I agree with you in principle, yeah. Any other questions? So if there are no more questions, uh, we're gonna finish up. Uh, next week, just to tell you what's going on, is it next week? Uh, yes, next week is Connor McBride on Epigram. That was mentioned here today. Um, 
So you're all invited to uh, attend. And uh, thank you very much, John, for waking up and giving this talk in the morning. Um, <laughs> and uh, thank you again. Thank you all for coming. Thank you all. Uh, to this group. Thank you. Bye-bye.